morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to the OMG MotoGP podcast with former Grand Prix rider and British champion Keith Hewitt and myself, Harry Benjamin, back off, back after what a week i think a week off yeah so thanks to amy reynolds for for uh, covering um coming up on the show it is just keith and i for this one and we are going to have a look back at all things india and if you've got questions queries comments as always you can send us an email it's omgmotogp at gmail.com um keith so india finally on the calendar and after lots of speculation we did get a grand prix we got a sprint race but it was an effort for a lot to get out there. But we did get some good racing and good to see India on the MotoGP calendar. Massive country, 1.4 billion people. That Uttar Pradesh, where, where, where it was held, 241 million people just in that region on its own. I mean, it's a market that Dorna have wanted to be in for some time. I, it was interesting. One of your um, colleagues in, in uh, F1 broadcasting, Karun Chanduk, said that uh, India needs MotoGP more than MotoGP needs India. In context, it wasn't as harsh as that. I've just made that sound. But he's right in that, you know, it's a big market that MotoGP want to break into. It's a big motorcycle market that they want to be a part of. So I would I would actually agree with Karuna in that situation. Um, great Grand Prix. You know, track turned out to be a fantastic track. Yeah, a few little bits and pieces here and there that, that perhaps need sorting for next next year, which will be on the list after the um, Rider Safety Commission meeting on, on Friday night. Um, but good Grand Prix. First turn, you know, tricky, lots of crashes and the like on that. But I suppose the the, the things that always seem to trip India up a little bit is is their uh, way of doing business is is slightly different from everybody else's. Uh, the visa situation was quite tricky. There were one or two riders, including Mark Marquez, who got there later than than usual. Um, of course, it's not that far around the world. It's uh, you're you're out of your, your time zone uh, synchronization. Uh, more than you'd want to be. Um, and with the debilitating heat, uh, and particularly the humidity, not even the heat as much as the humidity, it meant they had to shrink the races slightly. Um, only a lap off the Moto3 and Moto2 guys, but um, they took uh, three, I think it was, off of the MotoGP guys down to 21 laps. Um, and it did make a difference. And when you saw the state of Jorge Martin at the end, then you realised just how incredibly difficult and draining that this uh, this race meeting was was would be and they they will be thinking about that moving forward because we've seen it in tennis we've seen it in other you know sports athletics and the like when you're you're put into an environment where it is humanly nearly impossible to 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 perform at that level in those kind of conditions so it will be a concern moving forward but everybody got there in the end with enough time to get everything done uh, very interesting to see the uh, the Twitter spat between two heavyweights of the the journalistic world. Um, Simon Crayfire, a former 500 Grand Prix uh, winner, British Grand Prix winner, of course, from back in the two-stroke days, and now Dorna's um, pit lane reporter. Uh, he was hard, He was emphasising the fact that he's not employed by Dorna. He's a freelancer, so therefore he's a contractor rather than that. So basically, when Matt Oxy called him out and said that uh, he shouldn't be. Um, dissing the journalists that have been reporting uh, actual facts about how difficult it was to get there and so on and so forth. I think Simon turned around and said, well, there you go, boys. It was a great Grand Prix in the end. I don't know what all the shouting and hollering was about beforehand in you know, calling out the journos. And Mal he took a real exception to that. He's getting a grumpy old bugger in his age, is, is Mr. Oxley. And uh, he came back and said, I really take exception to what you're saying, Simon, you know, we're reporting the facts, and and of course Matt does. Um, if you if you cut away from Matt's politics and you stick with the motorbikes, he is one of the most accurate uh, and and truthful journalists there are out there. And he was he was asking riders what they thought, and of course a lot of that was picking up uh, momentum and and probably seemed pre Indian Grand Prix slightly negative in the reporting uh, department. But in the end, it all went very very well. It was a good Indian Grand Prix, and. Thank you very much for having us on the map. Yeah, I I wonder um, with the heat thing as well, and because we also got rain too. If they might think about moving where India is on the calendar going forward. Oh. Well, yeah, sort of moving the the country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they might sort of move it a bit more European. Yeah, uh, yeah. but you know, they, we just uh, I've just got back from Suzuka in Japan doing the F one, and that moves uh, next year. That's in April. So it's only you know less than six months since we're back in Japan. They moved it because of um, you know the, the the monsoon season. Yeah, I I don't 
I think it went okay. I think that, that you know, riders got what they were expecting. And the shortening the race was sensible. I don't think Jorge Martin would have lasted another lap, to be frank with you. The state he was in in Parc Ferme at the end of it. Um, it was remarkable on Grand Prix Day. Sprint race went according to plan um, pretty much for him. But um, the, the main race of Grand Prix on Sunday was definitely a... Having said that, you've got Cotteraro dancing all the way over to the fence, chucking his gloves and his knee sliders into the crowd. You've got Bezeki climbing gantries. They weren't suffering from it. You know, different things have different effects on riders. You know, I haven't heard whether Jorge Martin was suffering from any other uh, illness or something building up to it, whether he'd been drained by something else in the in the forerun to it. Um, it might just be the way the motorbike was set up. It might be the way he was having to ride the motorbike to make it work, and he was doing twice the work everyone else was doing. It, it's just one of those situations that sometimes, yeah, you know, even, here we go, back in my day, I remember 40 degrees of heat at Imola, first time I'd ever been abroad, and... I had to stand under the. I'm sick in sick in my helmet. It, it, the heat nearly killed me, and I had to stand under the shower. They used to have showers in the in the pit blocks back back then, and just run a cold tap over my head, fully clothed, just to try and bring the core temperature down. Once your core temperature reaches a a certain uh, you know temperature, um, you're in trouble. You're in big trouble. I mean, boy, Martin needed a medic on on you know Chartra was there to to kind of look him in the eye and see whether whether he got a major problem, and he had for a moment. Um, but once they, you know, and you often see, you know, uh, like wheelie bins. Yeah. Some people are too big to get in a wheelie bin, but generally um, motorbike races are pretty good for it. So you, you, <laughs> you have to have a, you'd have to have a double stack for you. That's yeah. six foot five of you. <laughs> but, but a wheelie bin full of cold water is, is what you do. You jump in the wheelie bin and you bring your core temperature down as, as quickly as you can to get yourself back working at the right frequency. So it is a major thing when your body overheats and if you can imagine being in full leathers boots gloves around a, a bomb that's that's absolutely generating so much heat from underneath you as well um it, it is quite a thing um and not something to be taken too lightly but i you know malaysia it's been hotter in malaysia i think i'm sure it's been hotter in thailand but at the time of the year you go to thailand it's beginning to be a, a drier heat by then and that, i think the humidity is the thing that, that really kills you it's the, it's the thing that really makes the difference i mean I, as you know, I spend a lot of time in Asia, and 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 I'm fine with the heat generally. Um, mm. But you won't want to go running on a on a on a soggy day where the the humidity is high. Well, I suppose one thing that the the heat did bring about um, was an upturn in form for Honda. What was that about? And Yamaha. And Yamaha. I mean, but it's. I think what it is is again. Everyone was slightly wary of, of where they'd be with data. We, we keep going on about how Ducati have an advantage because there's eight bikes on the grid and they can pick up the data and spread that data out amongst all the teams. So they benefit from having more bikes on the track at the time. When you come to a new track like this, that is important. Um, you know, it might just have been that the, the, the Hondas and the Yamahas, you know, their base setting was quite good for that particular racetrack and it seemed to work quite well. Cotteraro on the podium is, was remarkable, really. Uh, Mark Marquez was, was back on it, but it's a funny thing, isn't it? Uh, I mean, we could all say Mark Marquez was, you know, riding brilliantly and all the rest of it, but Joao Mir was right stuck up his backside all the way through the through the meaningful part of the race until Mark dumped it. So, um, again, it, it question marks for me Mark's performance. You know, is he the magic Mark, as he has always been for years and years and years, or is he slightly more ordinary Mark? You know, with Joao Mir, who's not had the, you know, the most fantastic of years either, or... or, or you know, physical um, preparation. He was right there as well. So the Honda obviously worked a little bit. Ruddle was take, taken out with, you know, Nakagami and the like. It was it was all a bit of a bun fight, wasn't it, early on? I mean, some of the accidents during the course of the weekend um, were, can I say, avoidable? I don't know whether I can or not. It, it just that turn ones like that, you just get tripped up. I mean, it, there was probably the, the Alcoba one in Moto2, you know, I struggle to understand, you know, Alcoba doing what he does as often as he does what he does. And the same thing with Alonso Lopez. I mean, he's another one. I wrote down at the time, these notes get written as I, as I watch what's going on. Bastard Lopez wiped out Dixon, lap three. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me for the swear word, but that's what I wrote down. <laughs> and then I wrote underneath, very poor from Lopez, exclamation mark, but no further action from Stewards. I just don't get it sometimes. I really, I really, 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 really don't. Every man and his dog was, was being as polite as they could be in the broadcast. I watched a couple of broadcasts just to see how it lined up with others from other countries. And 
Everybody was scratching their head trying to work out why he didn't cop a penalty for that when he took Dixon out. You know, it, 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 I, I, I don't know. I mean, still we have that, that grey area of, of stewarding. Um, you wonder whether they, they've got, you know, different cameras to everybody else. I, I just can't sometimes fathom it. But back to the back to the actual sprint race and the like, I mean, great stuff. 11 laps, that was all um, down from 12 because of the, you know, there were still damp patches, but it was mostly dry. So it was one of those ones where you couldn't be sure. We had, Actually, we had a slippy grid because of the, the, that massive great uh, grandstand on one side. You get the same thing at Sepang where the, the sun is the other side of the grandstand and it dries half the track. So it gives the guys on, on one side of the track more of an advantage than on the other side at the start because one half's dry, one half's damp. Um, but I noticed that the, the, the mechanics were allowed to use leaf blowers and the like to try and dry up that specific part of the, of the track so they, they, they got the traction that they needed to get off. Um, Marini is out, obviously, because he, he, he did his left shoulder. He fractured his left shoulder. He's got a long lap penalty for it as well because he took Bez out at the same time um, in the sprint race. So... And Bradl, Polis Bargro, and Augusto Fernandez were also off at the same same turn. So, yeah, you know, big, big aggravation in turn one. But we've said it before: everything is down, particularly in the sprint race, down to making up positions on the opening lap. You've got to, if you've qualified second, third row, you have got to force the issue into turn one. Everything is made up nowadays on a Grand, on a MotoGP bike, on the brakes, trail braking into 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 the into the corners. You know. Everything else is controlled by traction control or whatever to an extent. So, you know, you're, you may even be limited on, on that side of things once you've got the traction control dial in. But on the front end, of course, it's down to you. You know, you ain't got tra- you ain't got anti-brake lock or something like that on the front yeah. end. You, it's all down to you. So if you get it wrong, you're going to be flying up the inside of somebody and taking them all out, which is what we saw a lot of at Turn 1. Well, I suppose one of the big storylines to take away from the weekend is... With a, such a good weekend for the likes of Jorge Martin and, and, and Marco Bezzecchi, Peko Bagnaia falling during the Grand Prix, that's blown again. this title race wide open. Yeah, again. And, I mean, we've seen it before. He won from 90 points further back, um, going back you know, to his world title before. So it's, uh, it's, it, we know it can be done, and we've got a lot of races to still go yet. I think this will, start, this will be playing on his mind now. I think mean, Banyaya is um, it's it's going to slowly but surely get to you. It was a small mistake, but it was another one. Like you say, that that you know lost him twenty points at least. You know, it was a situation where he's kind of giving it back at the moment, isn't he? The world title, um, and he needs really to get it back under control. When we get to Motegi, you expect again the Ducatis to be fast there, but we've seen the Hondas work quite well there in the past as well. So, you know, Marcus tends to pull something out of the bag a little bit special when we get to to Motegi. Um, but again, the weather in Motegi, I haven't even looked at the um, weather forecast this morning, but you know that can be fog on the on the mountain. Mm. It could be absolutely slinging it down with rain, or it could be baking hot. So you're trying to bet on what might happen in Motegi. Um, we'll have Cal Crutzlow back, which will be good. Alex uh, Marquez won't be there, of course. He uh, broke a... Uh, what did he actually break? Three ribs in qualifying one, didn't he? They thought he busted two ribs, but he broke three in the end in qualifying one. So Alex Marquez won't be there. Um, still, we were expecting the Mark Marquez announcement between uh, the Indian round and Japan um, regarding where he was going. And of course, it's gone very quiet. He's played it down again, but he won't say that. I would imagine that when he gets to Japan, that's where the big talks come, um, because obviously it would be beating with the Honda. You know, what what do you think is going to happen? Personally, I I just I have this feeling that Grassini, you know, would be a good bet. I mean, I I think most people in the world would love to see him jump ship, but at the same time, he runs a massive risk. He knows how he's riding. He knows how he feels about himself. Now, if he feels that he will benefit from going to Ducati, and the Ducati is so much a better motorbike than the Honda that that's where he's got to go, then he'll go. If he feels that the Honda is probably better than the way he's riding it at the moment, then he'll stay. You know, I, I think there's there's more to this than than, than, than the, the simple fact that Mark Marquez is a genius, so therefore put him on a decent bike and he will win races again. Uh, I, I think maybe maybe there's a slight doubt in his mind if he jumps ship and he only performs the same way that he is now on the Honda, 
um, the the Mark Marquez bubble will have burst. Mm. We'll see. I mean, he's a brilliant, brilliant rider and a, and an intelligent fella. And he's thirty years old now, so he's got the maturity to work out what will be right for him. Um, but it is bloody intriguing. I, I mean, I love it behind the scenes at the moment trying to work it out. I mean, I'd love to see him to go to, go to 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 Ducati. Um, you know, and Grassini's bikes are going to be good bikes next year anyway. You can be fairly sure that the deal he'll do with Ducati and you know Paolo Giabatti, you know one of the main men at um, Ducati, you know, basically said that you know Mark and and Grassini are speaking. So um, we'll see how that pans out. But it's all going to hinge around you know Mategi. It's a Honda own track. The Honda Museum's there. It's a it's a great environment. You expect you know all of the Honda hierarchy to be at the track during the course of this coming week. Um, Exciting times. I wouldn't be surprised if we, if we, if we're going to hear anything. I think it will be Thursday press conference. Look out for an exceptional press conference on Thursday, other than a normal run of the mill um, press conference where everybody's just asking questions of half a dozen riders. Look out for a, an exceptional press conference. Um, we'll bring you that in OMG Extra. <laughs> I was going to say followed by an exceptional OMG Extra episode uh, straight yeah. after. <laughs> um, it could be quite a week then. Um, Aprilia seemed to f- struggle once again with heat issues. Again, brought it, bringing it all about. Where did the highest Aprilia in the Grand Prix? Uh, Vinales, wasn't it? In in eighth. And, and Alicia Sparga, even, I mean, he was... He has apologised, I think, for his sort of angry tone and reaction after being sent out too early in qualifying. So he wasn't too happy. Uh, so a bit of not, a pretty who looking so good just seemed to struggle a little bit more this weekend. I think that's the frustration for Alicia. I mean, I love the way Alicia. I mean, what you see is what you get with Alicia. He puts it out there as soon as he's a bit unhappy. I mean, it must drive management completely bonkers when he goes flying into the into the scenery like you did with his opinion at that particular time but it is frustrating when you can't make a bike bearing in mind how close everything is i mean that's always the issue isn't it i mean it's so tight in qualifying to 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 between them all i mean a tiny tiny improvement or in this case non-improvement makes a massive difference and when you qualify further down the field and you get clattered at turn one or you're you're know, under a yellow flag when when you're trying to make moves because people are in the scenery um, and he just got frustrated with it. But reasoning again is is probably lack of data. You know, it's it's trying to keep up on that roller coaster. We were dealing with damp patches early on in in the weekend. You know, as soon as you've got a track that's evolving as well, it's how you chase that track down the evolutions uh, scale. And you know, maybe Aprilia just weren't quite going the right way with a little bit of setup here and there. It's and maybe getting back to your Honda thing, maybe Honda were, were better place for that. And again, Mark Marquez has said many, many times, he arrives at a track and reaches a zenith really quickly. He gets on the pace on a new track, on a new environment, very, very quickly. Others slowly but surely. So his performance in in day one and day two were really, really good. Um, But by the time we get to day three and the longer races, everyone else is is pretty much caught up. You know, some riders are, are... and teams are faster at reaching the, the the critical point than than others. And I think Marquez is is he's like an instant explosion, isn't he? He arrives at a racetrack and he and he immediately finds the the absolute limit of the motorbike. Um, quite often when he's picking it up off the floor, um, than just about anybody else. I tell you what, just on that, we had a couple of questions. I can't remember precisely who asked this, but why do riders yeah. really struggle? Can't be yeah, why? <laughs> I know, I saw that. I, I've noticed it recently as well, just on the coverage, and and they really find it difficult. I tell you, it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, I, uh, I'm such a sad git. I really am. I was watching Sarah Lazito, I think is how you call her. Right? She's a brilliant, brilliant stunt uh, lady, for want of a better phrase. She's brilliant. If you've never watched Sarah Lazito, and you might not have done because she's a bit out of your bloody zone, I suppose, but. Um, she can pick a bloody great big four-cylinder road bike up. No drama at all, <laughs> getting back to the point you're making. So Sarah Lazito, you know, these stunters, they, they quite often drop them while they're, they're practicing their life. And if you, you look her up, look her on Instagram, wherever you want to look her up, she's all over the over the, over the the net somewhere, at Sarah Lazito. Uh, she's a French girl, I think. And um, I love her. She's brilliant. And 
she's always falling off the bloody thing. And she, and if you see her, you you'll get my point. She's very slight, shall we say? She's a skinny girl, and she can pick up a great big four cylinder bloody stunt well, with one arm. <laughs> well, and she don't look like she's got any arms on her either. I mean, she's she is a magnificent physique when you can think powder weight. She was she's quite. Um, and then when you see, but I think the the one that the, the guy who put that particular uh, comment in, you know, picked it up on a red hot exhaust, and that does tend to sizzle <laughs> fright, frankly. Yeah, <laughs> I think that was uh, it was Joan Mir, wasn't he, um, in India, who uh, had a, as we mentioned, had a better weekend of it. Um, well, you, the only the only bike you wouldn't want to be picking up is a, is a formula with a Moto E bike. Oh, well, they Moto are e -bike. They, those batteries they, are heavy. They weigh an absolute ton, so you'll have a job to get get one of them bloody things off you if it lands on you. But I mean, I I, I always, I'm always amused as well at the, the fact that they can't pick up 160 kilos or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> Just send Keith well, Ewan out there; it. he'll be able to do it. Bend your knees. <laughs> Actually, I I still surprise people with my strength. It doesn't last very long, but it's amazing. <laughs> If you've got that core strength, then it's 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 still there. But riders picking their bikes up, it is pretty pathetic. <laughs> and remember, bend from the knees always. Bend um, from the knees. Jack Miller, yeah. KTM. Oh, uh, sprint race looked looked all right, solid, but but there's just something going on there at the moment. It feel it doesn't feel right. Jack's just a bit off colour at the moment. Um, he'll he'll get back there. He's got a good mentality. He's strong in his mind. You know, maybe he's been doing some extra flights and needed to get back to Australia. You know, new baby, rah 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 rah. Yeah, maybe he's had his head turned a little bit at the moment. Um, that will sort itself out. Expect uh, Jack Miller come back as we as we move into the second half of the uh, the last half of the year. Um, I don't want to make a decision or, or make a comment really on Jack at the moment. He's not lost it. He's not. He's not become a bad motorbike racer overnight. Um, circumstances at the minute aren't really going with him. Um, and like I say, everything is so tight, so close. Sometimes, done this before. When you look at the monitor and see yourself two thirds of the way down the list, you think, "Shit!" What you should be looking at is the time. You know, when you look at the time, you think, "Well, I'm only three tenths off, and I'd be, you know, top third or something." It's tiny amounts of time you know and, and how long's two or three tenths you know you, you can just about blink in that amount of time it, it's kind of like it's relevant but kind of ir irrelevant to some extent he will get back on the pace again jack miller is a proper mobile racer and i've no doubt that he will he will be coming back if he don't there's a bloody lot of people waiting in the wings well one that everyone Shit. thinks is a nail on into moto gp uh, is moto 2 star pedro acosta um and it was a restarted race but it was controlled by acosta eased to victory in the end uh for the first ever well yeah indian moto 2 grand prix um what did you make of that moto 2 action well it was a disaster for the brits wasn't it sam lowe's being taken <laughs> out you know dixon being taken out um very very poor circumstances in both cases really but you know again Acosta is the real deal I think I put him down for winning the Moto 2 series last year as a as a rookie you know he's got that kind of class about him then you know Arbolino from Joe Roberts a superb ride from Joe Roberts as well to come home in third place the American um, showing his true worth again so I, it was a, it was topsy-turvy but Acosta's always there or thereabouts and it, and, and it was a great ride from him I, I think that disappointment for, for Dixon again I mean he's got to keep gritting his teeth and you know pole position and then basically you know nowhere at the end of the day um, it's hard to take when you're that far from home and you're working as hard as he is at the moment he's had a few things that I think actually the kind of accident the kind of scores that he's getting at the moment are ones that are going to make him stronger rather than weaken him because they're not his fault it's not something that yeah, well, he really should worry about. He just needs to get on and do his job, keep his head straight, and keep putting those times in. So we'll see. Acosta brilliant, but um, Yama Masia in Moto Three was even more dominant, wasn't he? I mean, that's the biggest margin that someone won by in Moto Three this year. Um, you know, Kaido Tobo, the two Japs, Japanese riders, second and third. Um, again, we were really unlucky with um, with Scott Optum. I side himself out. 
took out Suzuki. Um, looking really, really good, Scott Ogden, in, in qualifying. Um, at one point, he looked like he was going to be a front-row starter. He was on pole for, for quite some time. Um, so Scott Ogden is there or thereabouts as well for the MLAV, the, the Michael Laverty team. A um, bit unlucky. Brits, Brits had a bad weekend in uh, in India. Yeah. Um, well, uh, in terms of the Moto3 championship, but it couldn't be much closer after the Indian Grand Prix. Just a point separates uh, the top three. Uh, Mazia had looked uh, certain to t- take over at the top with his win, moving him on to 174. But then uh, the late exit of uh, Vieja, uh, so Holga- Holgado, I should say, gain a place. Um, and that has meant it is only a point between the three and uh, second sees Izaki just one point behind uh, and he has 173 points. And then in the Moto2, uh, it's Acosta who extends his leads. Uh, sixth of the season with that win in India. He's got 236 points uh, ahead now of the former championship leader, Arbelino, who's on 197. So Moto2 and Moto3 looking very nice indeed. Um who else caught your eye then in, in Moto well, I mean, what... There were some good rides for the likes of, you know, Ralph Fernandez getting a top 10. Well, I, I mean, I think with, with India generally, I got I all get a bit misty eyed about things like Mahindra and stuff like that. When we used to have the Mahindra you yeah. know, team that were out from, from India, they went into to electric car stuff, didn't they? <laughs> no accounting for taste, is there? But anyway, <laughs> I mean, they were brilliant in Moto3. I mean, they, you know, they had Bainayam. Martin Bezeki Binder all riding Mahindras back in the day, so there's there's quite a lot of history that go back there as well. So, well, I wonder if this Indian int- Grand Prix could kickstart uh, uh, an interest again. Well, you would hope so. You would definitely hope so. Um, the other news this week at the moment, they are part of of, of signs uh, the rookies champion and the, the sensational rookies champion. It's got to be said, Angel Piqueras um, for Moto Three next year in 2024. So we've got another really really bright star coming up from rookies um, to the Leopard team in Moto3. Um, <clears throat> but other than that, excuse me, um, what else caught my eye? I've got, uh, I would have said, slightly disappointing in the overall uh, trackside attendance. 112,000. Okay, a lot of people would give their left arm for that, like uh, at Silverstone. I can see um, Stuart Bringle look, uh, listening to this and thinking to himself, well, we only have 45,000 here and our investment is huge. Um, 112,000 over the over the over the weekend, 59,000 on the Sunday. I kind of expected more. Maybe MotoGP is about to blast in. There was a bit of controversy leading up to the the Grand Prix when a misplaced map, really, on the Moto uh, on Dorna's site, that missed out a couple of India regions in India. Bear in mind that politically, India is still quite a volatile kind of a region, an area, isn't it? I mean, there's a, you've got to get it right in India. The, I think India is emerging hugely over over the last couple of decades as as an entity of its own and will not tolerate the rest of us getting stuff wrong about India, quite rightly. I mean, their, their, their national pride is huge. Um, and I think that, that in those circumstances, you know, somebody getting a map wrong, it'd be like leaving Wales off or something. You know, you, you kind of, you'd be a bit pissed off, wouldn't you, if, if that was the UK and, and, and we missed a fair large part of the UK out. And, and, Somehow that went out. Now, some will say, what difference does that make? We all know all about what's going on. Well, it makes a big difference to to your, to your national pride, to, to, to the Indians. And and when you've got a thing going on at the moment, I've said it several times, you know, India is a name given by the colonialists back in the day, and Bharat is is the name that, that will probably supersede that. You know, if you had... Like Thailand was Siam at one time and changed to Thailand. We have name changes for different countries, don't we, as they sort of recover from their past and, and decide to change things. And I think India at the moment is very sensitive to certain things. So that was a bit of a faux pas on our, our part. Um, but it kind of resolved itself. But I wonder whether that had any, you know, whether it went viral in India and whether that had any effect on on the overall attendance. It, it may have done, it may not have done. I might be talking out the backside, but but it, it, it was something I picked up on, and, and certainly in some of the, the social media channels that I was following, it was quite, you know, there was a lot of um, comment, should we say, um, from India regarding that. Yeah, I'm just, I, I saw a um, a tweet of somebody uh, looking at the the Grand Prix, uh, the MotoGP figures for audience uh, attendance, and then comparing it to the F1 that raced there back in 
2011, 12, and 13. I think in 2011, it was something like 95,000 turnout. And then is that, that total did, over three days or is that I, the day? I believe that's, uh, I think that's, that might just have been on the Sunday um, for the Grand Prix. And then that went down for the following two years. So that decreased over time. And, and F1 had, had an Indian driver on the grid for, for two of those weekends. So uh, look at then comparing that to, to the MotoGP, I, I would say that's actually MotoGP is coming out looking a little bit better in, in that respect. Well, I think it will do as, as we It's a bigger we bike on. culture well, out there. Yeah, it's a massive bike culture. And obviously, you know, Royal Enfield is is an Indian manufacturer. Royal Enfield bought Harris Performance Products here. Steve Harris, Lester, Lester Harris. God bless him. Uh, Steve Harris no longer with us now. Lester obviously is. And Steve Bayford, who was the third party in uh, Harris Performance Products out of Hartford. Um, they did a load of chassis developments for Royal Enfield out there. And Royal Enfield ended up buying the British company here um, to better their products out there. I mean, and you see Royal Enfields old and new everywhere in, in India. I mean, it is a market. You can't say 1.4 billion people without being pretty impressed by the, by the possibilities. Um, so if MotoGP can get it right, if we can, and there will be an Indian rider somewhere in there that that, that may not even be riding on an Indian license, perhaps, or, or you know, that we will we will find. You know, look how many tie riders we now have that we we didn't have mm. really that were to the fore. You know, go back far enough and look how many Japanese riders we never had in Grand Prix. Going back to my era, there were one or two, um, but now you've got you know a succession of them sort of lining up. It is. It is what it is. It's a great market. It's, it's fantastic for MotoGP to be in it. Um, I hope that everybody in, in India that was part of it enjoyed it. And, it, and, and, you know, down to the marshalling. I mean, the marshalling there, you know, those guys have never marshaled a, a meeting of this type, of this quality, of this demanding. Um, you know, that, they did a good job considering that, that, yeah, that very, they obviously had some training of their own um, for their own benefit and i'm sure that they travel just like other marshals do to other countries to, to volunteer marshalling and the like but to, to marshal a, a motor gp um is a big deal and they will have had specific training from from dawner people and the like to make sure that they they fall within our you know protocols and, and etiquette um i think everybody did a good job in india um i, I don't think you could have got the the first one much better than they did mm. despite all yeah. the negativity yeah in the weeks previous. Hey, you know what? It's a good little track. I was sad when it left the F1 calendar because it was a good track and it, it was nice to see it back uh, on, on the TV screens again. Um, let's end, shall we, uh, on on this. If we go back to Marc Marquez and, and all these rumours around Grissini and where he might end up. But there's also with that talk of a bigger conversation once again around concessions and can they can the technical rules be changed to allow honda and yamaha concessions perhaps tied into if marquez leaves if he doesn't what, what's your take on this can only happen if the manufacturers all agree you know it's a it's an anomaly that i i think has been allowed to happen for too long there's no possibility of a majority situation it has to be everyone has to agree and i think that that makes life when it comes to technical um, rules and the like so unless you can say that you know one out of the of the manufacturers can disagree and that therefore um makes a change i don't know it's it's you know if it's if, if we've got a majority situation it, it adds a, a dimension to it where you might be able to get through a change that not everybody agrees with but would be good for the sport. And I think that's the, the key here mm. is what's going to be good for the sport moving forward. Everybody has an axe to grind when it comes to you know, the future. Right now, you know, you would say the Europeans have worked very hard within the rules to get to where they've got to. I mean, the investment that Ducati had put in, why would you give Honda, who've ruled the roost for so long, why would you give them a concession if, if they don't deserve it? Um, for sure, concession can come back for them if they finish badly enough for long enough. Um, well, why would you give something away to your competitor? You know, same with Yamaha. You know, the investment that Ducati have got on the grid, eight bikes, eight riders, all the team's hospitality and stuff that goes into that, um, you know, you wouldn't give it back to it. Okay, so Honda have got a four-man team out there with LTR, with Lucio Cecinello Racing and, and and the like. So there is, there's a you know four bikes on the grid. Yamaha have only got two bikes on the grid. 
you know, Yamaha should have invested a bit more, perhaps. Mind you, we've got Cal Cruxo back to rescue the situation of Motegi. Um, hope that goes well for him. I'm really looking forward to seeing Cal Crux, though, I've got to say. It was good to see the um, the LCR team running the Castrol colours again at, uh, in India. Everyone appreciates the Castrol colours. Old school. I like do love me. a good uh, an old school livery. Everyone loves an old schooler, Keith. Um, well, look in in terms of Moto GP after the the crash in the Grand Prix, Pekka Banyar does still lead the championship, two hundred and ninety two points, but is only thirteen points ahead of Jorge Martin with just seven Grand Prix remaining. So it is gonna be a fight to the finish I think and one that will be certainly one uh, to watch and we're straight into a race weekend again it's Japan this time around oh maybe I should have stayed out there should have uh, should have wangled uh, uh, a paddock pass for the MotoGP um, we could have sorted you one jump. of those that wouldn't have been yeah, any trouble that, at all oh, yeah. gosh, that is a, 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 an oversight there isn't it um, and you could have gone you could have gone to the drunken duck oh yes this is your favourite spot isn't it in, in Japan well Mito, Mito yeah we're we're I mean, obviously, Motegi's up in the hills. They chopped the top of two hills and made a, a, a an IndyCar track around the outside of a, of a road course as well. I mean, it's an incredible piece of engineering in a place that you just wouldn't think anybody'd get permission for it. I can't imagine how they got permission for it, but I won't even go there. <laughs> and of course, you, you've got the, the the Honda Museum there, which is absolutely special. Anybody that ever goes out to Motegi must do that, and it will take you a day. And do it with someone like Julian Ryder, because whenever I I used to stand behind, wander around with him while he pointed. out Look at that! I, I can tell you, I remember seeing that. Good old Jules. Um, but it is it is a hell of an event. But Mito is is the town where we always stay. Um, and and there's an Australian. You can't believe it. Go all the way to Japan, and we go in an Australian bar, and uh, <laughs> it's owned by a fellow called Jamie, and and he it's just a great atmosphere. And of course, Erta, the International Race Teams Association, used to commandeer the top table for the Erta personnel with Mike Trimby at the head of it always. And, of course, Mike's mm. demise means that he wasn't there. But Jamie, before everybody turned up, he put this big banner on the outside of the drunken duck um, saying, Mike Trimby, thank you, and um, from Japan, you know, a big heart and thank you from Japan, which was, I thought, a really nice touch. But but we have had many bloody fairly raucous nights in there uh, in the Aussie bar in Mito. Of course, you can do everything else you want to do as well, and there is plenty of room for for that but it's we went for the atmosphere um yeah you probably went cultural down to no. the local noodle bar oh well, you, I, as much as we could although i tell you what i mean we had a we had a bit of a nightmare in japan in terms of travel logistics but that's a whole nother story um it is everything is quite far away but their train network once you get on a train oh my god they are so nice and everything arrives on time, departs on time. They're not messy. No one leaves any litter. It puts us here in the UK to absolute well, shame. Th there's a problem with the Japanese being as polite and as nice as they are because we always, because we always want to get out of there as fast as we can. I mean, so mm. it's, you know, it's a race to get to whichever one of the two international airports you're flying out of, Anada or Narita, I think it is, isn't it? And, one is further away from the track than the other, mm. um, but you can get an uh, you can get a nighttime flight out of there. So to get out of the track, get to the hire car place, dump the car, and then get across the city to the airport is a massive bun fight. But we're all tuned up for that, and so you don't do this, folks. This is these these are bad people that do these things, and they should be shot. Um, <laughs> You just do whatever it takes to get to the to car hire place on time so you can make the train to get to the airport. And yeah. it is red lights, wrong side of the road, everything. And the Japanese just go, thank you, thank you, after you. And it's yeah. remarkable. It's like being escorted as, as fast as you can to, to dump the hire car. And every year that goes up. But, but occasionally, and I came across one last year, you meet someone who's not prepared <laughs> for... for for your disrespectful foreigner to come into the land and, and break rules. And, um, oh, my God, then then all hell breaks loose. So that could be another edition, of course. As, and, uh, uh, as, as if, if you are well, Wayne Gardner, in, of course, in Japan. Wayne Gardner ended up in jail for the very, very thing for some time. Oh, my um, God. He, he ended up having a bit of a... 
bit of a fracas with a, with a carload of uh, Japanese people who were very polite, but of course they decided to call the police and Wayne, being Wayne, was a bit too abrasive and pushed and shoved like hell and ended up in jail. <laughs> and don't, Re- don't Remy do was uh, son. Son Remy was uh, was without his dad, which is probably a good thing to um, to to move forward in his career <laughs> for a while. <laughs> so don't don't do a Wayne Gardner then. But uh, if you are going to hire a car in Japan and you are there, make sure you have an international driver's license if you're from the UK, which is something we found out when we arrived. So that was fun. yeah. But you have to have, you have that most places. What's the matter with you? No, they're only five, can... they're five quid from the RAC or from the post office. Yeah, now, but no one there's told quite... no one told us we had to have an internet uh, well, for UK the driver's license. Is on the driver. No, it's not. It's not. I'm not having that at all. Actually, I wasn't the driver anyway, so it's fine. But anyway, and, another time, and, another story. And, and there's two types of international driving license. There's one for different regions with different languages in. So make sure you've got the right one for the country you're driving in. See, but apparently it didn't always used to be the way. Apparently, a UK it's always, one it's, could get you one, but it's since it's since the old Brexit. But it costs you nothing to get them anyway. There's no excuse. yeah, no, that is, the cost isn't the issue. But anyway, right, that, enough of that. Uh, we'll talk more Japan on Thursday, okay? Um, because it is the Japanese Grand Prix this weekend, and we look forward to it. But that is it for this week's show. Keith and I shall be here for extra. Um, so, any questions on Japan? Get them in. OMG at MotoGP. Uh, no, it's not. It's OMG Motor GP at gmail.com. That's the one. Uh, and uh, OMG Motor GP on social media. And you can leave us a review wherever you are uh, on podcasts, players of your choice. And we'll see you on Thursday. Bye bye.